uh, Jervis and I began an investigation of the um, differential central simple algebras. And we, we were kind of, we wanted to see was somehow that uh, co-cycles for algebraic groups played the same role in differential central simple algebras that co-cycles for finite groups played in uh, ordinary central simple algebras. And we were successful in that. And we uh, uh, got involved with thinking about what the uh, Brouwer group might be in that situation. Uh, we came up with the definition. This is actually uh, unsuccessful. Uh, well, it's a, a definition is a definition, but there were there there were difficulties with it, which uh, appeared later on in um, work that Ray Hubler and I uh, were working on. In fact, continued up to the time of Ray's passing. And uh, some of the things I explained in the, about uh, th that version of what the differential Brouwer group should be in the memorial symposium that we held for Ray uh, about a year and a half ago. Anyway, uh, to go back to uh, some time ago when Lourdes and I finished you know, with the differential Brouwer group, we thought, okay, differential K theory. And the thing to look at would be, um, you start out with the same kind of differential field with uh, algebraically closed characteristic zero field of constants. But then this um, Tanaka duality raises its head. And in fact, then we're just trying to look at the K theory for modules for this pro-algebraic group, the absolute differential Galois uh, group. And well, first of all, it's not really K-theory. The identities you impose are not just that uh, for direct sums, but also whenever you have an exact sequence, you make the isomorphism class of the center equal to the sum of the isomorphism classes of the two extremes. But anyway, when you do that for the modules for the pro-algebraic group, then you just come up with the, the free abelian group on the isomorphism classes of simple modules. And this is simple modules for the absolute Galois group. Well, <laughs> that was an answer, but it's not, um, it's not very satisfying because it's not easy to figure out what those are. So instead, we... Um, just decided to ask ourselves a question. Well, what about just uh, differential modules uh, over uh, commutative rings? And since we were over differential commutative rings, and since we were coming from the, um, uh, hoping to find a K theory, we wanted to use differential projective modules. So that's my, uh, preliminary remarks. Um, and now uh, I'll, I'll begin using my slides. And uh, Alexi, I'm probably going to need some help for advice of how I page through these. Oh, that, uh, Alexi, will the slides be online? Yes. Um, this is, yeah. So I just press this to go through them. Yeah. The right arrow. Yes. Okay. This one is here. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's a pity that you can't see um, uh, online this taking place because it was, or maybe you can because it's very helpful. Now we're ready to go. So definition R is a commutative ring with the derivation D. Differential R module is an R module with an additive endomorphism D sometimes, sometimes subscripted to indicate that it's uh, relevant to that module, uh, satisfying the identity that D of R times M is D of R times M plus R times D of M. And a morphism of differential R modules is uh, an R module homomorphism which commutes with the derivations. 
do I just press, oh, I better press down. No, right arrow. How do I get to the next one? It's uh, the down or right. So try to... Down doesn't work and right doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I just tap on the because it was just switched to Zoom. Now okay. th this screen is active, so you can just do right or go down the Okay, right. great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're good. So um, just to say again, the example I mentioned earlier uh, informally, if uh, R happens to be a differential field and um, A happens to be an N by N matrix over F, then you can take the free module of rank N over FM and define a derivation according to the formula that the derivative of a vector V is, um, I'm thinking of these as uh, vertical vectors, V prime, that means differentiate each component and then multiply by A. So this is an example. And uh, in this example, the uh, constants the elements of the module of derivative zero are precisely those that satisfy the differential equation V prime equals minus AV, which is of course the reason that these modules are relevant in differential Galois theory. So differential modules are related to differential equations by the expression just given. And a full set of solutions then would be a basis V1 up to Vn of Rn, well, in this case, R is, is F, with um, each of them being a constant. So here's an example, another example, R is a polynomial ring uh, over the complexes C of T with um, derivative on C zero and the derivative of T being T. Uh, notice that makes the ideal generated by T a differential ideal of the ring C of T, which means that the module <clears throat> C of T mod, uh, the ideal generated by T, which I've denoted C0, is um, uh, it's a differential R module. Um, the way it's an R module is uh, you evaluate T at zero. So this is a differential R module, but it's not a projective R module. So, and here's a non-example. The same ring, but now uh, mod out by the ideal generated by T minus one. That's not a differential ideal. Um, the way it's an R module is by evaluating T at one, but there is no um, additive endomorphism that makes this C1 into a differential module. If there were, then look at what the value, uh, where it would have to take one to some element alpha, and then compute the uh, T to the N acting on one, both by the way the derivation has to act as a, by the um, Leibniz rule, and then also the way that it just, if you just act. and you come out with the contradiction that for every n, n plus alpha is alpha, which can't happen. So there's no possible derivation in that. Um, here's an alternative description of differential modules. Um, I'm starting with a, this uh, differential ring R. Then, Rxd is a polynomial ring Rx with multiplication such that R is a subring, and that um, the it's not central. And the way you get uh, an R from the right of the variable x to the uh, left is by adding on the derivative R. Now. Uh, this is, of course, a well-known construction and differential R modules are the same as left RxD modules. Uh, the, the way X acts on an element of the module is just the derivation and vice versa. So categorically differential R modules, that's the modules over a ring. And so it's 
abelian with enough injectives, enough projectives, direct sums, et cetera. But since RXT has no non-zero or finitely generated left ideals, non-zero projective differential R modules are not finitely generated. So projective differential, that is projective as differential modules, projective as RXD modules, they can't be R finitely generated unless they're zero. So um, why? Well, a projective differential module, that is a projective module over RXD is a submodule of a direct sum of copies of RXD, possibly infinite. But if it's non, if it's a non-zero submodule, then its projection onto one of those copies is also non-zero. Now that's a um, an RXD submodule of RXD, so it's a left ideal. And since there are no finitely generated left ideals, the uh, projective module couldn't be finitely generated. And um, I just mentioned here in an asterisk why there are no finitely generated left ideals are finitely generated left ideals. If there were, then it would contain um, a polynomial of um, a non-zero one, it would contain a non-zero polynomial of maximal degree. And then when you multiply by X, the degree wouldn't be maximal anymore. So, uh, I think I have to, yes. I'm going to come back to our alternate description too. I should mention now that there, before you actually start seeing them, there are a number of typos in this that I only discovered um, in the last few days. Uh, I've been traveling um, the past week and my iPad, although it's a wonderful device, doesn't have tech. So mm -hmm. the slides are what they were when I sent them to Gleb uh, a week ago today. So anyway, we've just established that there are no finitely, uh, are finitely generated projective differential modules. However, if, a, if I have a differential R module, um, which is finitely generating projective as an R module, which I can well have, but we've seen examples, then we'll, we'll say that's differential projective or differential finitely generated pro projective if we need to emphasize the projectivity. Now I wanna give an alternative description of uh, differential modules, um, not using the ring RXT, but using the ring of dual numbers. So uh, we still have our differential ring R. And R of epsilon is the dual numbers, you know, that's uh, defined by the, that epsilon B square zero. And R maps to uh, R of epsilon by carrying an element R to R plus its derivative times epsilon. Now, here's the first typo. I, I, this is a section to the map of R of epsilon to R by epsilon goes to zero, but that map, that first maps two should be just a two. There's R of epsilon's mapping to R. Uh, R of epsilon's in R algebra. That means R of epsilon modules are R modules via the map of R to R of epsilon. So if M is an R module, uh, M of epsilon, it means R of epsilon tensored over R with M. That's an R and epsilon of epsilon module, hence it's an R module. M of epsilon maps to M by mapping uh, epsilon to zero, that's an R module homomorphism. And if I happen to have a section of it, that has the form M goes to M plus D of M, M epsilon, where D of M makes M a differential R module. In, in brief, if I have a section of M, M of epsilon to M as R modules, then M, has a differential R module structure and vice versa. 
Okay, so as a consequence of this uh, description, if M is a projective R module, then in fact, it has a differential structure. Why? I have M of epsilon mapping to M as an R module homomorphism. It's mapping onto a projective R module. Uh, an epimorphism of R modules where the uh, target is projective splits. Therefore, every projective module is a differential projective module in at least one way. Um, here, I comment on the fact that it, suppose it's in, uh, a differential R module in two ways. Well, then the difference of the two uh, derivations is actually an R linear endomorphism. And on the other hand, if you had a differential structure and just add an R linear uh, endomorphism to it, you get a new differential structure. So if DM is one differential structure on M, then all of them are just D of M plus T as T ranges over uh, endomorphisms of M. So let's sum up a little bit of this. Every projective R module has a differential structure. Some non-projectives have a differential structure and some non-projectives don't. That was examples uh, two and three. Now, um, there's a very interesting theorem by uh, Yves Andre, which says, if R is differentially simple, then every differential R module is actually R projective. So in, in particular, uh, <clears throat> this would apply to picard vesio rings. And it tells us it, for such a ring, if R is differentially simple, and projectives and only projectives have differential structure. Uh, okay. Now, um, these, are, these are corollaries, not of uh, Andre's theorem, but of the fact that every uh, projective R module has a differential structure. If M is a differential finitely generated projective R module, then there's a differential finitely ge generated projective R module N, such that the sum is differential and uh, as an R module free of finite rank. So it'll be one of those of the form where the derivative is the um, uh, component wise derivative on a vector plus multiplying by a matrix. Now, this is a corollary of the fact that every projective R module has a differential structure. So we just start with M, it's, it's differential. Take an N such that M uh, plus M is R free, then put some differential structure on M. Then the sum M plus N is a differential module, which is R free. And the same is true, um, you know, uh, we won't need it uh, today, but it's also true for uh, that finitely generated projective R modules um, have a tensor complement. There, you can always tensor them with another projective to get a, a free module, and you can make that differential if you want to. The fact that every projective R module is has a differential structure means that the functor from the category of differential projective R modules or differential finitely generated projective R modules to the category of R modules is subjective on objects. You can find by example that it's not subjective on morphisms. That is, you can have two projective modules and a map between them, or module map between them, and you can't put projective uh, structures on the two modules that makes the map between them differential. But there's some approximations that you can do, and I'm mentioning them here. Uh, if you just start out with any differential R module and any projective R module that happens to map onto it, 
then you can put a differential structure on the projective module that makes the surjection in the R mod, uh, differential. And if you happen to have two differential modules in a map between them, uh, R module homomorph, uh, excuse me, two differential R modules and a differential homomorphism between them, then you can find projective R modules that map to both uh, differentially and a map between the projective modules, which lifts the original, original differential map. Neither of these are saying, because it's not true, that any uh, morphism between projective R modules can be made into a differential uh, morphism by putting appropriate project uh, differential structures on the projective uh, modules involved. Uh, <clears throat> we've already settled that every differential finitely generated um, projective R module, it, that's another typo, is a direct sum end of a differential finitely generated R module, which is free as an R module. Okay, now what would it mean for such a finitely generated uh, differential projective module to be a differential direct sum and of a finite direct sum of copies of the differential module R? Well, here's the answer. Um, com you'll see, complete with typos. Suppose the R module M is a differential direct sum and of a direct sum of finite copies of R. Then the submodule of constants is a finitely generated projective uh, module over the ring of constants, and M is isomorphic to R, not RD, but R tensored over RD with MD. And conversely, if we start out with a finitely generated projective RD module, then when we tensor it up to R, this is, we get a differential direct sum end of finitely many copies of R as a differential module. And the, um, the differential uh, constants are the original module. Um, if M happens to be isomorphic to R, not RD, but R tensor over RD with M0, where M0 is a finitely generated RD projective module, we say that M is induced from M0. So if M0 is free, so is M, then M has a basis of constants and conversely. Now, the proof of the theorem is trivial and it's in the slides and Deb will show you the slides and so I, uh, I'll skip uh, reading it to you. But um, I do want to remark on the fact that the map from <clears throat> R tensor over RD with MD to M is um, uh, localizes on RD. That is, if you um, have a multiplicatively closed subset of the ring of constants, then uh, you can invert that all the way through and you still have a, it's the same morphism. So because it localizes, it's an isomorphism, if and only if it's an isomorphism locally on RD. So um, we're gonna come back to that, but I wanna make, make a few comments about um, R modules, which are uh, differential R modules, which are free as R modules. So we'll start out with such an M, finitely generated uh, R module, free as an R module, and choose a basis. So actually I'm looking at the RN, these are um, column N tuples. And uh, we have actually, uh, let's say we have a differential structure on M, that D sub M. Well, we do because it's a differential finally generated R module, but there's also the component wise derivation. All right, so this is two uh, differential structures on the same module. The differences are linear. We're talking about uh, tuples of elements of R. So the, the linear map is given by multiplication by a matrix A. So any differential structure on an uh, 
on Rn is given by um, component-wise derivative plus multiplication by a matrix. And I'm going to denote this module Rn comma A. And it, um, if it happens to have a, a basis of constants, then actually Rn is induced from the um, the R RNA is induced from its constants, which is the, just the sum of the, uh, the submodule generated by the VIs. So suppose P0 is a finitely generated projective RD module. And then um, locally, there are elements of RD summing to one such that um, when I localize by each of these elements, I get a free module. Then when I induce uh, this P0 up to R, um, I see that uh, when I localize at these same elements of RT, that the resulting module P localized at uh, FI is RFI free and has a basis of constants. In other words, P induced implies that P is locally given by a matrix differential equation with a complete set of solutions. So an induced differential finitely generated projective module is in some sense completely solved and uh, vice versa. Okay, so um, once we know as we do that uh, any differential finitely generated pr projective module is a direct sum end of one which is free as an R module and one which is free as an R module is given by in terms of some matrix A, we can artificially induce um, a uh, basis of constants by uh, taking an extension of R. This is exactly like solving the differential equation um, with the picard vessio extension. We just uh, take indeterminants that satisfy the differential equation and uh, add those on to um, R, make this ring S. And this differential ring then has the property that when we tensor up the S, the uh, original um, module becomes uh, the direct sum of copies of S, a differential module. In other words, it becomes completely. So S is finally generated and faithful as an R algebra, but figuring out what SD is, uh, that is what uh, the module is that uh, uh, induces the SD module that induces up to S tensor or RP. Describing SD is not, not an easy task. So this is a statement in principle, but it's not actually a, a way to completely solve projective modules. Okay, now um, I, I want to talk about um, actually classifying them. And this is, the, this is our substitute for K theory. And it turns out that the problem was trying to have a group and uh, we resolve that by having a monoid instead of a group. This was the same, um, in fact, this is inspired by the uh, analogous situation that, uh, or analogous conclusion that Ray and I claim, came to with Asimov algebras, that it, to make, to have something which, uh, seem to capture the situation properly, we needed monoids rather than groups. And I'll explain where the uh, group problem is uh, uh, in another slide. But anyway, here we go. We look at the isomorphism classes of differential finitely generated projective R modules. So this is uh, made into a monoid by declaring that the sum of two classes is the class of the direct sum and that the um, uh, 
class of the zero module is the identity. Okay, so that and now we impose a relationship. So we declare classes equivalent if they differ by freeze with entry-wise derivation. That is, P is equivalent to Q if <coughs> P plus the module Rn with component-wise uh, derivation is isomorphic differentially to Q plus Rm with the uh, component-wise uh, derivation. So, I mean, you need to check uh, some things about this equivalence relation, but it's, it's the kind of thing for which you can form the quotient monoid. And we call the quotient monoid the differential uh, projective class monoid. Now, what it means for something to be trivial in that monoid is that is that P is uh, equivalent to the isomorphism class of P is equivalent to the isomorphism class of zero means that differentially you have P plus Rn zero isomorphic, differentially isomorphic to Rm zero for some N and M. Um, this implies that P is uh, stably trivial as a module and so we we'll call this differentially stably trivial. The projective class, the differential projective class monoid of R uh, doesn't map on to the uh, K zero of R uh, because we've set some things equivalent to zero, but it maps onto what's called the reduced K group. That is uh, K zero uh, of R where you mod out the um, subgroup generated by the uh, class of the ring itself. Uh, now you notice that this is this this is certainly a monoid homomorphism. The domain is a monoid, but the image happens to be a group. Now, um, okay. The uh, if I look at this reduced K zero for the ring of constants, that is. K zero uh, of R D modulo the uh, uh, subgroup generated by R. This actually injects uh, into um, the differential projective class monoid um, just from the tensoring up. Its image is precisely the subgroup of units of that monoid. Now, why? Well, these, the things that you, you remember, these things that tensor up are the things which are direct sum ends of things of the form Rn zero. So you tensor it up and now you've got something else, which when you add to it, you get uh, something which is equivalent to the zero class. So that's how you get units. And it, the converse is also true. Um, I can't tell here because of, uh, okay, I think this is all right. Um, I'm taught uh, the, the map to K0 or reduced K0 from PC diff is uh, a monoid homomorphism. So it doesn't really have a kernel, but um, in the, uh, sense of, um, monoids, it, it's the things which go to the same thing uh, are isomorphism, well, classes, uh, which um, uh, differ by uh, um, classes of differential modules, which are free as all modules. I, uh, one way to understand this is to say this kernel is the submonoid of isomorphism classes of differential projectives, which are free as all modules, modulo those with entry-wise derivation. All of those things certainly go to the identity in the reduced K0. Um, the co-kernel here, um, this is a monoid modulo a group, but that's that, that also means um, what it means in, uh, you know, uh, 
taking um, orbits, but you can just think of this as a, a coprimer, that this is, uh, since uh, reduced K0 of RD maps precisely to the units of uh, PC diff, this quotient um, has no units and uh, it maps onto the quotient of the reduced K groups. Now, um, the co-kernel, that's what I mean by this PC diff modulo its units. This classifies differential projectives up to sums with locally completely solvable modules, the, these things that come from uh, RD. Also, the co-kernel has no units. So this is a torsion-free monoid. Um, which is, is likely to be big. Uh, and now to ex uh, point out this, um, the reason for monoids. We can have a differential ring R and a differential projective modules A, B, and P with A plus P isomorphic to B plus B differentially, but uh, it's not the case that A and B are equivalent in the sense of being uh, becoming differentially isomorphic when you add on um, the Rn zeros. Now, what this means is that for any group G, the map from the projective differential differential projective class monoid of R to G cannot be um, injected. That this, so that's why it's monoids and not groups. Um, and I mentioned here because I haven't mentioned it before that uh, PC diff is a functor, functor on differential rings. Now, um, I would like to uh, just tell you a little bit about uh, a couple of examples and then skip to something at the end. So first of all, if we're talking about an affine algebra over, uh, over a field, a differential field with algebraically closed field of constants of characteristic zero and it's picard vessiel closure happens to have an infinite transcendence degree over L then it's always the case that any uh, differential uh, F algebra, which is finitely generated as an algebra over F, has infinite um, projective class, differential projective class uh, monoid. Now you notice this means that it's always gonna be the case that this can't have uh, all of its uh, modules, all of its uh, differential modules being trivial. It, they can't all be completely solved. Uh, it's the affineness here is important and there are, um, there are examples um, where this, uh, where we have such things uh, where the, this, uh, projective, differential projective class monoid is trivial. Um, I'm going to skip over this, uh, uh, these, these next parts here because I want to uh, talk about this um, alternative description of uh, projective differential modules, which is a way to get um, projective, diff a way to show that any projective module over any finitely generated projective module over a differential ring is um, carries a differential module structure. In this case, in, an, in a fairly explicit way. So, first of all, is an identity for any differential ring, not necessarily commutative. Uh, if E is an item potent, then um, if you look at uh, 
the derivation of A obtained by the derivation you started with, and then inner derivation with the item potent and its, well, the bracket of the item potent and its derivative. This is also a derivation. Of course, it's a derivation because we took a derivation and added an inner one to it. But it happens that this is a, a, a derivation such that the derivative of the original item potent E is zero. Okay, so this is this is a statement about rings with the derivation, um, and this just popped up in some fiddling. I've, uh, some some time ago, we've never run across this anywhere else, but it's just just a fact. And of course, because this um, what you were modifying the original derivation by uh, an inner one that uh, it agrees with the original one on the center. So now how, what this has to do with projective modules. So start out with a finitely generated projective R module over differential ring R. And suppose it has, well, I'm saying now explicitly, suppose it has N generators. Okay, so there's an R module surjection from the free R module Rn onto P, which is call it F, and it's split by some uh, G. So let E be the uh, resulting endomorphism of Rn that you get by first doing, going down with F and then come back with G. So the endomorphisms of Rn are matrix ring, and E is an item potent, <clears throat> and its image happens to be isomorphic to P. So, That means, if, uh, according to the that formula above, that E is a, of course, it's an item potent endomorphism of Rn, but it's actually a differential item potent isomorphism endomorphism of Rn when Rn has the differential structure given by the uh, bracket of E with E prime. Since it's a differential endomorphism, its image is a differential module. Its image is P. So now we have a differential structure on P from uh, this observation. Um, I want to apologize to the audience for uh, getting a late start. And I want to end with thanking the organizers. Now, usually, you know, you thank the organizers for inviting you, and I am grateful for being invited to be back in the uh, Colchin seminar in, in person for the uh, first time in uh, several years. But I also wanna thank the organizers for um, carrying forward this uh, Zoom seminar, which makes it possible for those of us who live a long way from uh, New York to participate in this uh, weekly. And furthermore, I really want to thank the organizers for their custom of using the Zoom feature of breakout rooms to make it possible for uh, those of us in mathematical isolation to communicate with other differential algebraists once a week. So uh, with that, I want to, uh, uh, I want to uh, end. Thank you. Your slides be online, Andy? It's my understanding that they, yeah. they will yes. be. That's great. Questions? So, uh, Hi, Andy, it's Michael Singer. Um, I don't see you right now, but I'll talk to your slide. Um, can you hear me? Um, I Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so the question I have is, have you thought about this uh, for several derivations? Um, that's a that's a good question. and the um, and it's uh, the the answer is yes and no. Um, okay. uh, so let me let me tell you the the uh, yes part that um, several derivations, 
um, mean usually means um, an action of the uh, uh, abelian Lie algebra on, uh, with finitely finite number of generators. So actually, you could talk about it. You, you could talk about any um, finite dimensional algebra acting on uh, modules, and that um, that uh, you can formulate. Um, uh, all these things, um, because you can formulate the analog of the RxD the, uh, for any, really for any Lie algebra. Um, nonetheless, it's not true that the, this, um, uh, that for multiple derivations, that we we don't have the same kind of r to the analog of r to r of epsilon so it's not clear that with multiple derivations that um, every projective is actually every projective r module carries a um, a, a differential structure uh -huh. so Running into that brick wall uh, was was kind of a uh, oh good I I can see you on the screen here right. so um, running into that brick wall uh, was the reason that uh, we didn't pursue that any further yeah so and just a, a related question uh, do you know if if there is some kind of differential syzygy theorem. Or does it make sense at all to think of, and that's why I'm thinking about uh, the partial case. Does it at all make sense to talk about resolutions? Well, yes, sort of, um, um, but only ordinary that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but maybe that's not as interesting. So uh, in the, um, well, let me uh, uh, put in some parameters. So uh, if we're talking about, um, there's a, things which are algebras over a differential field. And furthermore, uh, algebras which have the property that every element satisfies a ordinary differential equation over that differential field. So that, and, and then uh, only modules that also have that property. So that's a, you know, that's a, res a restricted thing, but it still includes uh, uh -huh. card vesicle rings and things like that. Then there's a, a, co um, a complete theory. You can say what the, um, how to do, uh, actually projective resolutions are not, are not so good, but, uh, injective resolutions and what the injective modules look like and so on. There's a, there, there's a whole uh, elaborate structure there. So in, I mean, in that, in that sense, there are um, cohomology of, uh, of differential modules. Um, you know, even if they're, even though they're projective as R modules, they still have, can have non-zero Cohomology is differential modules, and there's a whole sort of theory like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Ali Guo here. Hi, Lee. Good to see and, you. Yeah. Hi, Andy, and hi, Michael. Um, so, my question is yeah, maybe you mentioned in the talk when the message. So um, for these uh, differential modules, right? So they are um, representations of um, differential algebra, right? Algebra with a derivation. And uh, um, so, but, but those modules, they are, uh, they correspond to the kind of usual module for ring of differential operators, right? So, so ring of differential operators, um, then the module would be the usual module theory. Um, have you, uh, 
uh, uh, exploring that uh, context, or maybe you mentioned that I missed. Thank you. Um, did any of you understand the question? Sorry, maybe I should repeat. Uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. So um, the module, as you yeah, described, before. right, Andy, uh, it's, a, it's a module together with a um, module version of derivation. So it's not a module in the usual sense. In the usual sense, we have an associative algebra, and then we have a, a representation of the algebra on some space. But in the, you know, in the case of a differential uh, module, um, you actually have a module. In addition, you have a derivation. Um, but this kind of a differential module, um, this should correspond to the module over the so-called ring of differential operators. So it's built on this differential ring um, in particular, this particular differential operator, but it's much bigger. You know, it's a ring of differential operators. And uh, then um, any differential module corresponds to a usual module, you know, the ring theoretic module of this ring of differential operators. So uh, um, sure. it's hard for me. Uh, lead to uh, my <laughs> okay. Since we've since we've last talked, my my hearing has uh, degraded yeah, even I more. But um, <laughs> I, I think I think the point is that the 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 point is this that the um, what that um, it's like uh, uh, with this example of the. Uh, RxD ring that um, when you when you when you look at modules over uh, rings of differential operators, then um, the the thing I'm focusing on is the uh, is the R module properties of the modules, and when they're when you're looking at them as modules over these uh, over these other rings, then um, yeah. it's sort of hard to. Well, I mean, you you can say there there are modules plus, but it's kind of hard to say what uh, you know, how to characterize this projective. One possibility is to say that when you look at um, uh, that you're looking at <coughs> R modules over a, uh, and then you also have them, there are also modules for these rings of differential operators. You require them somehow to be, to have so, some sort of torsion, you know, so that they're, uh, they're small modules. Uh, so the finite dimensional over R or finitely generated over R or something like that. So that's the, that, that's, um, uh, I guess I have to say, for the, just from my own experience, mm -hmm. that the point of view of uh, looking at, at these modules as modules over a ring of operators um, is not as suggestive as looking at them as, um, you know, just projective modules with the derivation. I agree. So. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... Right. Just mention in passing that actually there are also some study on this uh, representation uh, modules of uh, rotaback size. Um, oh, but I guess I should say that to, to be fair, that <clears throat> um, you know, following up on what you're saying, that uh, the the reason for looking at at uh, modules over a ring is that modules are representations of the ring. And so we, you know, you really, the reason for looking at uh, differential modules is that you're looking at uh, representations of the ring of operators. So it's sort of the, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, this is this okay. devolving into philosophy and not particularly. <laughs> 
your philosophy, yeah. but anyway, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I, I think I understand what you, what you mean, uh, Andy. Yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, um, if you convert to a ring of differential operator, then um, you don't see the operator so uh, intuitively. Yeah, so yeah, we, we had a similar experience with uh, studying Rotabex modules. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Andy, uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so what does this do to uh, linear differential equations? How does this help linear differential equations? How the what differential equations? Linear differential equations. What does this do to linear differential equations? Consider projective models. Uh, are there any, so um, uh, I think Alexei just asked me if there are any differential equations for which this uh, method solves them. Yeah, so for, for any use, yeah. yeah. Any differential equations? Are, linear are differential missing? equations. Linear differential equations. Linear, are there any linear differential equations that this method helps to solve? Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, um, Uh, I think the answer is I think the answer is no because that the uh, <clears throat> uh, there is um, you take your linear differential equation and uh, <coughs> uh, and write it in this uh, in this form uh, you know as as a, as a module then. Um, uh, there's uh, there's nothing particular uh, about the module that helps you solve the equation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, uh, it's conceivable to me that the that uh, if you oh well, look at a particular equation um, and use that to make a module over a ring of functions. And then, then it's if you happen to be able to say something about the ring of functions, then you can say something about the you can say something about how to solve the the, the differential equation by from from that uh, context. But I think uh, basically the answer is no. This is looking at uh, um, what kind of projective modules can a differential ring have. Thank you.